Princess Yachts, the UK's leading luxury yacht manufacturer, proud sponsors of Motorsports Formula One coverage. Without any further ado, please welcome on stage Gordon Murray and Simon Aaron. Well, Gordon, thank you. Sorry, there's been a slightly longer introduction than normal. Um, thank you very much for joining us. Yeah, um, pleasure. I, um, I wanted to talk briefly about modern Formula One. Many years ago, I came to see you and asked what you would do if you were in charge, and you did this amazing little line drawing, which all made sort of total sense. What are your thoughts on these new regulations coming in in 2021? Uh, I don't think they go anywhere near far enough. I, I, I think the politics these days in Formula One gets in the way generally. Um, what I did with you, I mean, how many years ago was that? that we I think that was that? three. I think it's longer than that. Is it more? Yeah. Probably. Yeah. It, I, I think it's nearer five, right. actually. Yeah. It's still probably up on the internet. Um, it's so easy to fix natural, normal overtaking in Formula One and so easy to reduce costs and get the emphasis back on a driver's championship. And everything I said then, I had a look at it again the other day, actually, and I think everything is still true. Um, the one thing they're doing, which goes a little bit towards uh, what I suggested, is putting the downforce back in the middle of the motor car. At the moment, with the huge front wings and rear wings, the reason why, you, one of the main reasons you can't overtake is you're following a car onto the corner, onto the uh, straight, and you lose the balance of the car, and therefore you drop back, and you start at a disadvantage. And therefore you need stupid things like, artificial things like drag reduction to catch up again. Whereas uh, if, you, if you don't lose the balance of the car, if the downforce is mainly in the middle of the car and not concentrated at both ends, um, you lose overall downforce, but you keep the balance and you can come out right behind the car. I mean, that's one of the main points. And that one, I think they are doing a little bit to reduce end downforce and giving the designers a bit more back in the middle. But, but all the other stuff that I wrote is much more about making it a spectator sport again and, and making it a drive. It's a driver's championship. I mean, the drivers at the moment, they get in and steer. You know, the team decide, they decide where the gear changes are before they leave the factory. Really? Yeah. They sit in a simulator and pick all the gear change points. Uh, they're told when their tyres are going off and well, the engine mapping needs to be changed or whatever. Even Simon could be a Formula One driver. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit of a stretch. If, <clears throat> if you talk to any of the engineers who are working in Formula One presently, mm. they say that, yes, the rules are prescriptive in terms of the error and stuff, but you know, beneath the surface there are all these little things you can do. And they, they think that's fascinating. You're an engineer looking on from the outside. Yeah. I mean, when, when your Formula One design career was at its peak, I mean, you could see the different solutions. You used, to, you used to look a massive great fan on the back of the yeah. Brabham. I Cyril put four wheels on the front of the car. Yeah. yeah, you could see these sliding skirts. You could see these things. I mean, are you fascinated by what they're fascinated by? No, absolutely not. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's actually, I mean, from my point of view, it's cobblers, to be honest. But from their point of view, you can see their point because the youngsters have only known modern Formula One. So they think spending 230 days in the wind tunnel and changing um, Benetton, for example, oh, not Benetton, um, Red Bull, make a million different parts a year. And a lot of them never get used. But they're all tiny little aerodynamic adjustments. So the youngsters who didn't live through what we lived through in the 60s, 70s, 80s, um, think that's exciting, changing, you know, finding. I mean, these days, if they find a tenth of a second, they have a public holiday. <laughs> we could, in, in the 70s, you could have an idea in the bath, draw something that night, make the bit the next day, put it on the car, and go second a lap quicker. And it was visible, as to take your point, because the cars were visually quite different. The regulations today actually place all the major masses for you as a designer. So the fuel, the driver, the engine transmission, uh, the pedal line relative to the front axle is all regulated. So the cars actually have to look the same, if you think about it. So, I mean, even, even, a, even a sort of seasoned petrol head like me, if you, I reckon all the modern cars, if you painted them all white, covered them up, you know, put you in a room and whipped the cover off and gave you 30 seconds to name them all, 
you probably couldn't. What was the most successful Formula One car you designed in the bath? <laughs> that was probably a fan car, actually, uh, because that literally was a, a light bulb moment. You know, I used to read the regulations like... In the bath. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I went to sleep reading the regulations, <laughs> looking for loopholes. We'll, we'll talk about the, the, the fan car in a bit. I just want, You mentioned Red Bull there, and Nigel Mansell was sort of... Um, singing the praises of Adrian Newey. Do you, who, who stands out to you at the moment as a Formula One kind of designer or engineer? Is, is there, are there other people in the paddock? Who... Uh, it's, you know, that's, a, that's an almost impossible question to answer. Thank I'll tell you, you why. You're welcome. Because <laughs> in nine, from 1973 to 77, I knew I was chief designer because if you turned around in the prefab drawing office, there was nobody else in the office. <laughs> <laughs> they now have a technical team of 600 people, and I have no idea how you manage 600 people to design a Formula One car. First of all, I don't know what they do. Uh, <laughs> but I mean, how, how, it's, it must be really difficult for somebody like Adrian to think of themselves as a chief designer because you can't possibly manage all those people. I remember when you were doing the SLR with um, Mercedes-Benz, and our team grew when I did the McLaren F1 road car. We had seven people in the design team. And that grew to 35 people when we did the SLR for Mercedes. And I went over there, and I was speaking to their technical director, Dr. Schopf, and he said they had 11,000 engineers. And I said to him, how do you manage 11,000 engineers? And he said, you don't. Well, that was it. So, <laughs> uh, how, how the hell do you manage 600 designers? I, I don't know. So it must be really difficult for people. Like, I mean, Adrian's a really good friend, and I admire him tremendously for his achievements. But it must be very difficult to feel like you own the car. You know? I mean, I, I, I very quickly, from 77, I doubled the design team because I hired David North. So, um, and, and then I felt like I was still in charge, you know, because I had one other guy to manage for the next five years. Um, but 600 people, wow, I wouldn't even know, you know. I mean, even the current supercar, T50, we've only got 20 people on the design team. It's amazing, yeah, it's far, a far cry from Formula One. But you originally came to the UK because you wrote to Colin Chapman yeah, to get a job, and he, and, he, yeah. and, he, and he gave you one. Yeah, well, he offered me an interview. Right, actually. It's all in the book. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, I wrote, Chapman was my hero, absolutely my hero. Um, Bob Dylan and Chapman, growing up as a teenager. And uh, I, just, I just admired uh, his approach. I admired his sort of fanaticism for light waiting. And I loved the cars, you know, both the road cars and the, I remember when the Elite came out, um, it was 57, October 57, Earl's Court Motor Show, and I got the magazine. They used to come by ship in those days, so it took a month. Got the magazine and saw the, the Elite. I thought, wow, you know, what a motor car, composite motor car. So I admired him. So I thought, well, what a, bit, what a good place to start. I'll write to him. I'm, I'm jumping on a cargo boat and coming to England. Need a job. And I got a really nice letter back saying, uh, speak, come and see Brian Luff, who was head of vehicle engineering. I wasn't looking for a job in racing. I didn't think I would be anywhere near good enough for racing. I was 21 or 22 or something. Um, I was looking for a job in the road car company. And I arrived and went for my interview with Brian Luff. Hadn't contacted Lotus for six months. And uh, apart from the fact I found England quite cool after Durban and South Africa, and I arrived in a short sleeve shirt, no jacket, and it was snowing. <laughs> um, and I, <coughs> I arrived at Hethel for an interview, and Brian said, you know, haven't you read the papers the last three months? We're going through a mini recession. We haven't, all those cars out that window aren't sold. We've just laid 30 people off. And that was it. I never got to meet Chapman until much later. But you, you did, sorry, Simon. So, I was just saying, you said uh, the you know, auto car or whatever it was took a month to arrive out in South Africa. Mm. How easy was it for you as a youngster following motor racing in the pre-internet age? I mean, Autosport, Motoring News, Motorsport would have taken a month to get out there yeah. as well. You had non-championship Formula One races in South Africa in the, the Grand Prix from 62 or so, but 
I mean, was it easy for you to kind of follow what was going on? Uh, there's two sort of answers to that, because there was the local motor racing, and then, as you say, the international teams did come out there for a few events. Um, so following that was quite easy, because uh, I, my, my dad used to race motorcycles, and we were taken to some sort of uh, race meeting uh, every couple of weeks, really, hill climbs, uh, speedway racing, um, that sort of stuff. Um, so local racing, I was right in the heart, from, from five years old, I can remember going to motor races. But international racing was a little different because everything was delayed. <laughs> you know, everything was sea mail in those days, you know, nothing came on aeroplanes. Um, however, I did start going to the international races out there. My first international race was East London Grand Prix yeah, in 1959, where I hitchhiked. 400 miles as a 13 year old down to see the race in East London um, and then of course after that they had the Sunshine Series where the uh, sports cars used to come out and do nine all the latest Ferraris, Porsches, things used to come out and do the nine hour Carl Army which we, again we used to hitchhike up to Johannesburg to uh, see those. Amazing and when you obviously it didn't work with Lotus but you did then you did then go to Brabham Eventually, yeah, yeah. I mean, I tried, I tried to get a job uh, for six months actually, um, and I'd, I'd saved up, I'd sold absolutely everything in South Africa: my racing car, my road cars, my drawing board, magazines, records, clothes. I think the only thing I didn't try well, and sell. That's why, that's why you turned up with an earlier shirt. That's what you had left. <laughs> <laughs> yes. The only thing I didn't try and sell was my mum, I think. <laughs> but I sold everything and I, and I scraped together a thousand quid. And then the first thing I did with no job when I got to England, I bought a badly put together, hand assembled, second hand Lotus, high mileage Lotus of land for 840 quid. <laughs> In the first week, Look, lo lots so of I trouble. Had, usually, so I had 160 <laughs> quid, which had to last me six months, while I was looking for a job, and I almost got a job at um, Fair Oaks Aerodrome was uh, Alan Mann Racing, and they just got the job in 1970 of doing the, uh, th I think it was called the 3L uh, Le Morcar for Ford, which was the follow-on from the GT40. And uh, they were advertising, Len Bailey was advertising for a draftsman designer. And I turned up there. And by this time, I, I was so low, I think it was down to about 15 quid or something, but I didn't want to sell the Lotus. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> oh, brother, and, uh, oh <laughs> well, this time I got married as well. So my wife didn't understand that balance. <laughs> 15 quid versus secondhand Lotus, which kept falling apart. Um, anyway, cut a long story short, Len Bailey was messing me around, did want somebody, didn't want somebody. And then one of the old chaps in the design office said, he's, he's never going to take on anybody else. You know, he's messing around. He's got a very tight budget. Brabham up the road, Brabham Formula One team were looking for somebody. And I, I walked from there to Byfleet uh, and knocked on the door. And they, Ron Tornak interviewed me, gave me the job. Fifteen minutes later, the guy, the real guy for the interview, turned up. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's a little bit right place at the right time, I think. Yeah. But you were very much thrown in the deep end of Brabham. Oh, yeah. 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 They, well, Tornat, uh, I really got on well. A lot of people not uh, wrong. I, I really admired the guy for what he did. He was a very practical designer. And Jack, of course, in those days, was still driving in 70, that was his last year, and uh, I got involved. I thought Jack was fantastic. You could talk to him about anything. But once Ron Tornak found out that I could do stress analysis and I could do suspension plots and Ackerman steering plots and stuff like that, suddenly I was sort of flavor of the month, you know, because I got, I got to do all those and all the new cars. But I still wasn't yet designing a complete motor car. I was doing bits and pieces on, and in those days, um, I think we had, the, here's a bit of a uh, counter position for the thousand people in the Formula One team now. We had 17 people at Brabham. 14 of them were technical. Uh, the other three were um, secretary, accountant, and cleaner, 17 of us. And we made 60 production cars every year. 
We did Formula One, Indianapolis study, the odd hill climb car with 14 people in a shed, basically. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a bit different now, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. They, but Bernie obviously then came in and bought the team. Yeah. Um, but what, what's the story with when Bernie arrived? Because he, he kept you, I think, against... Yeah, Wolves. nobody really knew what was going on with Bernie because he just sort of appeared and he used to turn up, turn up once a week and shout at people and leave. <laughs> um, but it was pretty obvious from day one. He, he bought, that's right, he bought um, Jack shares. Jack had 50% of the business and Ron Tornak had 50%. And he bought, Jack wanted Al, so he bought Jack's 50%. And then he just couldn't get on with Ron Tornak. I mean, they were really, you know, just chalk and cheese. And uh, so eventually he bought Ron's 50%. But we didn't know that because nobody, nobody communicated anything. So we were all wandering around trying to do Formula One very badly in those days. I mean, scoring no points at all. And we had about five designers, I think. We had Ralph Bellamy, Ray Jessup, me, a couple of other guys. Jeff Ferris, and uh, I, 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 it was a mess. You know, I didn't, I didn't know what the hell was going on. And then this chap, Alan Academy, turned up and said, I want to design an all-British three-leader prototype to try and win Le Mans, and I want you to do it. And I've got a five grand budget, and I'm going to pay you 200 quid to design the car. <laughs> And a Hewlett Packard calculator, um, <laughs> which he said was worth 60 quid. I'm not sure why. Uh, so I thought, I went home and spoke to the, the wife, and I said, you know, I, nobody knows what's going on at Bradman. It's a hell of a mess. I think I'm going to go with Alan, because I get to do my own car from scratch and go to Le Mans. And so I went down to the pub with Alan, and had a handshake deal. Actually, I should have. He didn't have his wallet with him, so I ended up paying. It should, <laughs> it should have been a little bit of a warning. Um, and, and I was just about to tell Bernie that I was leaving, and Bernie turned up one day and he said, uh, I fired the other four guys. I'm sick of finishing eighth in the championship and not scoring enough points. Your chief designer, I want a brand new Formula One car for next year. You've got the whole gig. Um, so I had to say to him, you know, I, I, I don't like double-crossing anybody, so I had to go back and say to him, look, I've just shaken the hand of Alan Cadene to do this Le Mans car. Um, but, but this sounds great. So he said, do both. He said, you can moonlight and do the Le Mans car. <laughs> so I was finishing at Brabham at night. We were in a little um, rented flat in Claygate, which had n no heating, and this was the winter of 71 zero heating at all and uh, I used to get back from Brabham at nine and work until three on the Duckins Le Mans car and then be back at Brabham at 7.30 for six months and uh, did both of them, did the brand new Brabham and did the, did the Le Mans car. And did the Cadenet pay you the 200 quid? Yeah, yeah, actually, oh actually I've forgotten, yeah it was 250 quid. He didn't mention the calculator. But when I finished the car, he said, I've only got 200 quid. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, Alan hasn't changed much. <laughs> and uh, he hadn't, uh, uh, but, but this Hewlett Packard scientific calculator <laughs> is worth 60. Right. So actually, you're out on top on the deal. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, but seriously, um, that car really, which, which was running fourth at Le Mans behind the three Matras, passed all the works, Porsches and Alphas, that put me on the map really, so it was worth doing. But the, the first Brabham, your first kind of Brabham was nearly won its first race. Yeah, BD42 was leading, um, I think it was Harama, Spanish Grand Prix. Yeah, it was actually leading and we, we split a constant velocity joint rubber boot and the grease came out and we stopped with a few laps to go, yeah. Amazing. Did, did you hit it off with Bernie straight away pretty much? Absolutely, because he left me alone. You know, he was, <laughs> <laughs> he was, he was really good. Um, he just said, get on with it. I want a car that can win Grand Prix. You know, get on with it. What's it what, what was it that you 
change. Obviously, you're starting from a clean sheet of paper. Mm. But and you you were saying before Bernie came and no one you didn't know what was going on. It was all slightly chaotic. Yeah. If you can sum it up, what's the key ingredient to make a successful Formula One car? I think it, it goes beyond making a Formula One car. To win a Grand Prix, there's five elements you need, and you still need, actually. And over the decades, there's more emphasis on some of the elements and less on others. And the five elements you need, you need really good car design, you need good aerodynamics, you need the right engine or powertrain, let's say. You need the right tyre choice and you need the right, right organisation. And if you've got one of those missing, it's very difficult to win a Grand Prix. And if you've got one of them missing, it's impossible to win a championship. And uh, we, we didn't, when Bernie joined, we didn't have, we had the tyres, we had the drivers, we certainly didn't have a car. The engines were average, I would say, and I don't think we had the right team. And I, I was, Bernie let me put that team together with the right mechanics and the right team manager. Herbie Blatch was my team manager. And uh, we just put those five elements together and made them work in the car. We were successful. Was it not quite daunting designing a Formula One car from scratch? At that you know age, what? I, 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 when I was doing the book, I actually thought about that. I thought, you know, I was... When Bernie made me, because quickly, within a year, I went from chief designer to technical director. I was running the business, hiring and firing, organizing test teams, helping pack the truck as part of the job. And uh, I was 25 or 26. And I think back now, I, I, I should have been terrified. You know, I, I look at 26-year-olds now, and I think of running a Formula One team. You know. um, but I wasn't. I, I don't remember being worried at all. So I must have had a lot of self-confidence, or just being bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> you, you talk about the, um, the five key elements mm. that were required to generating a successful Grand Prix car. Just out of curiosity, I know that your prime responsibility was to make the thing quick, win races, but your cars all, certainly up until the turbo era when you had all the extra cooling nonsense mm. that made them a bit fat around the back, your cars also had a certain aesthetic. I mean, did the look of the thing matter to you? Because, I mean, the BT42, the, even, even when the Hexagon Racing Pad painted their BT44 brown, it still looked good. <laughs> um, you know, it's, the, your cars have this certain elegance. <coughs> I, th I think it's a funny question because it was important to me, but it wasn't a driver. The cars had to be quick and they had to be right. But I'm really unusual for an engineer. Most engineers can't draw a stick man. If you give them a pencil and paper, then they're not artistic at all because it doesn't go with the territory. But I actually started in art when I was 13. And by the time I got to high school, I was going to major in art because I, I still draw and paint and stuff and graphic design and things. And um, a, a school, I was at a government school and a teacher, my art teacher, wrote to my parents, which was unprecedented in those days, and said, this guy spends the whole art lesson drawing electric guitars and racing cars and <laughs> suspension <laughs> systems in, in the back of his book. I don't think he should go into art. But I already enrolled in art at high <coughs> school. So I did a month of art, and then I switched to technical drawing. Thank goodness, because otherwise I wouldn't be here, and I'd be a, a really poor artist. <laughs> eking out a living somewhere. L yeah. Listening to Bob Dylan LPs. <laughs> yeah, well, I still do that. <laughs> the, t the fan car is obviously, well, for me anyways, was sort of one of the many highlights during your, your Brabham stint. What, why did you come up with that idea initially? Because it wasn't, yes, you obviously wanted the, the downforce, but it wasn't it to do with the radiators and actually trying to cool the car? No, no, no. It was, it was, it was to do with... Um, Peter Wright and Chapman inventing wing cars or ground effect with skirts, if you like, which they sort of stumbled on with the Lotus uh, 78, 79. And the way that worked is you had these, I mean, we all remember probably these big Venturis down the side of the car, so the car needed to be really narrow. And just where the wings started coming up happened to be opposite the engine. And of course, a DFE was quite a narrow, at the bottom of the crankcase and the sump was quite narrow. And you, if you swept the exhaust up over the cam covers, you could have quite a big Venturi and a diffuser 
past the engine. We had a great big lump of an Alfa, Alfa Romeo <laughs> flat 12, which the cylinder heads and the exhaust stuck right out where the Venturi had to come up. So by the time we all discovered what Lotus had done and started laying out a potential car, um, I could see immediately that we, we just couldn't have those big Venturis because the engine was right where we needed them. That where the diffuser started, I beg your pardon, not the Venturi, the diffuser. And uh, I said to Bernie, you know, we're, we've had it, really. <laughs> we're not going to be able to do one of those. The Ferrari engine was quite a bit narrower, so they kind of sort of did a semi-ground effect car. So I did what I always do, got the rule book out again, and looked at Article 3.7 under the aerodynamics regs. I still, still remember the number. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and, it's, and it was about movable aerodynamic devices, and it said... Quite simply, if something's, if anything on the car's primary function is to uh, is to, is designed to affect the aerodynamic performance of the car, it has to be stationary relative to the sprung mass. In other words, you couldn't have anything moving, fans, wings, flaps. And that was because the early wing cars had moving wings, if you remember the late 60s, and they collapsed yeah. in big crashes at Barcelona and places. Um, so... Well, I thought, well, we have a fan on the back, and we suck the car down, and 55% of the air goes through a radiator to cool the car, and 45% sucks the car. I never said it didn't suck the car down. That, that surely is primary function. So I went to a lawyer, and I said, uh, <laughs> if you've got two <coughs> functions, which one is primary? And he said, the one that's bigger, the one that's more than 50%. So... On the fan car, exactly 55% of the air was sucked through the radiator <laughs> and 45% sucked the car down to the ground. But the effect was much bigger than I calculated because we got the skirts to seal really well. So the thing, I geared, the fan had to run off the back of the engine, or the back of the gearbox actually, so it was directly driven. Uh, and at 12,000 engine revs, the fan was 7,900. If it went over 8,000, it exploded. So we had to limit it to seven, nine. They exploded anyway, actually. <laughs> uh, I think the people that made the fan blades lied. Um, <laughs> but um, so the car, if you rev the engine up to 12,000, you can stick the car on the ceiling, it would stay there. So it made more than its own weight, which meant you could do a 2G start as well without any wheel spin, uh, which was... Not good for the drive shafts because the drive shafts used to, <laughs> they, the drive shafts were titanium and gun and gun drilled, so they were hollow, and they used to wind up 180 degrees and stay wound up. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. But uh, do I remember you saying that you hit it with a dustbin? Because it was exact. It was there was a dustbin. Yeah, that was exact. just one of the mechanics. I mean, the people, of course, led by Chapman, were crawling all over the thing, and I thought. You know, I don't want, we've got a bit more than half the season to go. We can win easily. Um, if we win every race we finish, we would win because we were 30 miles an hour quicker in a fourth, a fourth gear corner. Um, so I didn't want other people photographing the fan. It, it wasn't just a fan. We had a stator. You're looking for pressure recovery with a fan design like that. And behind it, you have a stator with the blades going the other way, which recovers some of the pressure in the fan efflux. So I didn't want people photographing that because it's taken us a long time, taken us three months to develop it. Um, so I said to the guys, go and find some material to cover it or, you know, clip over the back. And they came back with a dustbin lid, which actually <laughs> fitted, per it just went click. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a dustbin lid from Andersdorp, but we didn't bring it with us. <laughs> <laughs> a Swedish dustbin lid. So. Because it, it, it went out and won its first race, but it, yeah. it, wasn't actually, it wasn't banned. No, it was never banned. No, it's, been, it's been misreported so much. It was actually uh, a political thing. Even in those days, we had politics. Uh, Bernie was starting to gain traction with um, the Formula One Constructors Association, which was banding all the owners and managers together and getting some power to fight FISA and the FIA and the CSI. Um, and it was working pretty well. But Chapman, being Chapman, could see his championship. I mean, we, uh, 
Nicky Lauda drove around the outside of Andretti in the marbles, you know, on a, on a third gear corner. <laughs> it was a joke, really, how much quicker it was. And Chapman could see the championship disappearing completely. So he, he went round and got, uh, I think it was Tyrrell, oh, four or five of the other team owners together and said, we, you know, this is dangerous, you know. Um, he told Andretti to go around and say to people it was throwing stones out the back and damaging cars and hitting the drivers and stuff. The fan E-flux was actually 55 miles an hour and anything heavy was going at 90 degrees to the fan, not that way, so it was all rubbish. And actually, to, to Mario's, um, yeah, to his sort of, he, he was interviewed um, on television last year and they asked him about that and he said, no, that was just Chapman telling me to say that. So he could try and get it. He said he never did anything like that, you know. Uh, good old Mario. So um, Chapman bandied around and they went and everybody put in a protest at the circuit. The stewards came round. I had Article 3.7 open and well thumbed. <laughs> and I showed them and they went, OK, you know, we have to prove that 55% cools it, but we, you can race, that's fine, you can race it. But after the race, we're going to seal the car, we're going to seal the bodywork, and we're going to seal the transporter, and we'll come and measure it back in England. So we won the race, and they sealed it all up with lead seals, and we put the car back in the truck. As it finished the race, they sealed the truck, and the CSI technicians came round with an anemometer, and we, they made us rev the fan up from like 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, and they measured the air through the rad and the air through the fan. And they got 60% going through the radiator. So I got, um, I felt quite bad about that because it was only supposed <laughs> to be 50, 55. Uh, and uh, so I got a letter from them saying you could race the car for the rest of the season, but we will fix the loophole at the end of the year. But by then I already had the BD47, twin fans, variable pitch blades, <laughs> um, on the drawing board. And, uh, but then Chapman got four or five of the other team owners to write to Bernie and say, if you continue to race the car, because they all got a letter from the authorities to say the car was legal, if you continue to race it, that's the end of Formula One constructors. We're disbanding. And Bernie could see all his hard work. So he came to me and said, what do you feel about withdrawing the car? You know? And I went, you know, obviously I was a bit miffed. Um, <laughs> And uh, after all the work of designing it and testing it and getting it to work. So I said no to start with. You know, it's crazy. We're going to win. Every race we finish, we'll win and we'll win the championship. And if they ban it after that, don't care. You know, it's another championship. But he talked to me and talked to me and about the future of Formula One and eventually wore me down. Um, no money passed hands, I promise. Um, and. I eventually agreed to, uh, to withdraw it. And we wrote back to them and said we wouldn't race it again. But I was so pissed off. We'd built three cars. One of them we took to Sweden. We didn't have time to finish assembling the third car, so we took it to Sweden as a, as a box of spares. But it was a complete fan car. And when we got back, it was outside in, in a sort of a box. And we didn't have much room at Chessington. So the, the mechanics came to me and said, what do we do with the third car? And I said, take it outside and chop it up. So we chopped up a fan car. <laughs> Don't know what that'd be worth today. <laughs> well, yeah. probably, someone's probably found the chassis plate and yeah. rebuilt it. So it's the original car. Um, 1982, the, the, another innovation, the refueling. Yeah. And I think it's probably easy to think that just refueling a car mid-race is quite a, an easy thing to do. But it's far from it. Oh, yeah. It was at the time. Just, just talk us through some of the things you had to think about with the refueling. Cause yeah, sure. Because the um, mind boggles. Yeah, and mine did at the time. <laughs> uh, it was, there's always been pit stops in Formula One, but they've never been strategic. They've always been to fix something. So you have a puncture or, you know, the car runs out of fuel or starts running out of fuel or something. Uh, fix a bit of loose body work. So changing wheels was a really lengthy process, you know. So um, I worked out that on the average circuit, the bogey time to win the race would be, if you put new tires on and half tanks, the bogey time stopped would be, not stopped in the pits, but lost, would be 26 seconds. 
So if you could slow down, stop, put 35 gallons of fuel in, and change the four tyres and go out and get back up to racing speed in 26, 7, 8, 6, and you'd win every race, basically. So um, the current pit stops were 26 seconds, at least, let alone the whole time. So we started um, redesigning the hubs, the wheel nuts. We introduced air guns, captive nuts already in the gun. And we did a lot of video work. It was early days of video, but a lot of video work. And then I got all the mechanics around, and we studied the video dozens and dozens of times to see where we could just save another point of a second or half a second or whatever. So we got the wheel changing down to a fine art. I had air jacks on the car. Um, but then the refueling was another thing altogether. Because to get, I wanted to get 30 gallons in in three seconds. <laughs> and um, I, I needed two and a half bar to, I calculated, I needed two and a half atmospheres of pressure to do that. So we went out and bought a lot of aluminium beer barrels. And we had two beer barrels next to each other, all painted nice blue and white. <laughs> and we had a, a five inch diameter hose from one to the other. And one was pumped up with just air to two and a half bar. And the other one was three quarters full of fuel. And then the, fuel, the air above that was two and a half bar. And then the guy had this huge hose over, over his shoulder. And, and when, when you opened the fuel valve, you clipped it on and turned it, you, you couldn't actually see the fuel. It, there was just a rumble for three seconds. And you had 30 gallons in the car. <laughs> But it was potentially a bomb, you know. And, and one of the funniest things was that before the guy opened it, the chap on the other side of the car had to put a breathing tube on because if you didn't put the breather on, you did blow the car to pieces. And we did blow one to pieces in, in testing. In, in Paul Ricard, we actually literally blew a monocoque into pieces because the guy didn't get the breather on. Was anyone in it? So, uh, yeah, a mechanic was in it, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> He was okay. He was, he was all right, yeah, but the monocoque exploded <laughs> outwards, luckily, not inwards. And, um, and 30 gallons of fuel went up in the air and vaporized and then came down as a fine rain. <laughs> We're all standing there looking at one another. So you're getting wet. You're getting wet. <laughs> and in those days, you know, in those days, in the 80s, people were walking past with fat. <laughs> <laughs> When we sat down as a group and, and looked at the brief originally, um, foiling kind of jumped out as, a, as an option. Traditionally, hydrofoils on powerboats have just been static and they've, they've, they've helped to increase the efficiency slightly. These not only do that, they're, they're active, so they, they help control the roll and pitch of the boat and make the boat not only more comfortable, but, but safer and easier to drive. We are on the cusp here, I think, of changing the direction of the boat industry. AFS works in conjunction with a reimagined hull concept. Low transfer immersion brings higher efficiencies at cruising speeds. Foil lift replaces transfer volume, allowing top speeds to still be achieved. Foils automatically deploy and retract flush with the hull. The foils rake fore and aft, varying the angle of attack. Port and starboard foils are controlled independently. Onboard sensors and a dedicated processor calculate the optimum foil position 100 times per second. Foil position is actively controlled, reacting to the boat's state, improving comfort, stability and safety with modes selected by the skipper. So, um, so I tried all sorts of mechanical interlocks, so literally mechanical interlocks, so it couldn't go wrong. So the guy on the breather, you know, there was a, a lever through the monocoque which wouldn't let the guy turn, and they all looked sort of iffy. And eventually I came up with the concept, when the breather guy, that if you remember the 52 was 50 and 52, quite narrow monocoques above the fuel tank, the breather guy, his head was halfway across the car, and the filler guy's head was, so they were virtually eyeball to eyeball. So I came up with a system where I said to the, 
them both. Breather guy, you don't look up until you've got the breather on. It's all happened in a third of a second. You know. It didn't take seconds. And then the, the, the fueling guy was looking at the breather guy. They were this close. And until you see the whites of his eyes, you don't open the filler. And, and it worked. We did all the races like that. When, when did the other teams get wind of what you were up to? Well, we turned up. Unfortunately, we were going through a really bad patch of um, turbo failures with BMW. So we never finished races. We turned up in Brands Hatch the year before the championship with a modified BT50. And yet we, you know, we rolled out, and all the other teams, we rolled out these beer barrels into the pit lane. And then, oh, the other thing I had to invent was tyre heaters, because the tyres took a lap to warm up. And nobody had tyre heaters in those days. So I built a thing which looked like a Doctor Who TARDIS, a wooden, a plywood blue thing, a telephone box, with the four tyres stacked up and a gas flame in the bottom. <laughs> And this is all in the pit, by the way, <laughs> next to the refueling equipment. Wait, which might blow up. <laughs> and then we had little holes that we could put the tyre probe in because if you overheated the tyres, the compound went off and, and blistered, which we did a couple of times too. The you know, car came in, whoo, put the tyres on, oops, you know, put another set on. Uh, so I had to invent tyre heaters as well. And we turned up with these telephone boxes and beer barrels and people going, they do, you know. But we never got to half distance because the turbos kept blowing up. So people never saw what we were doing. So I said to Bernie, we've blown it. You know, we'll go to Brazil the first race next year and everybody will have small half tank cars. And the only team that had done anything were Williams. And it was a half hearted attempt. They had a full size tank with a fuel filler on it, but which they didn't think they were going to use. They had it as an, a sort of an experiment. And of course, we just turned up. The car finished the race, we won. And then after that, everybody was scrambling around trying to see what we were doing. So good. The, obviously, after, after Brabham, 17 seasons there, you then went to McLaren um, with Ron. Yeah. And I don't know Ron, but you're obviously a very colorful designer with floral shirts and, and things like that. Ron, less so. Um, <laughs> 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 this man's very tactful. <laughs> how, was, how was that relationship? Because I think you, had to, you put something in your contract, didn't you, about clothing? And yeah, I just had written into my contract, outside a race meeting, I could wear anything I liked. <laughs> so when everybody else was wearing blazers and ties on the aeroplane, I was in a T-shirt, usually a rock and roll T-shirt or something, <laughs> plastic sandals. Um, yeah, that didn't. Uh, yeah, Ron and I never really got on socially. We 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 moved in different circles. You know, I don't think he knew what, who Bob Dylan was actually. <laughs> um, um, but but again, like Bernie, he gave me complete carte blanche to do anything I wanted um, with the team. I restructured the team. I restructured the test teams. I I brought in uh, composite manufacturing facilities which they didn't have. I brought in all sorts of test procedures and restructured everything. And, and with the cars, it also just gave me a completely free hand. And with three years, three championships. Yep. And it was only ever going to be three years, wasn't it? I think it was that. that was yeah, no, idea. that was my deal. I, I, so I, I wanted to stop after Bradham, really. I thought 17 years was enough. And then when Ron pers finally persuaded me, because I kept saying no, um, and uh, he finally persuaded me, and I said, right, that's it, three years, which will make 20 years in Formula One, and that's enough. You know, that's, I needed a new challenge, too. I was getting a bit tired of Formula One. And, and part of that was, did you know that you were going to do a road car after that? No, no, not when I started. It's just 18 months into the three years, all very well being bravado about it and going, you know, I'm only doing three years, then I'm off. But when, you're a bit, when you've got 18 months to go, and after Formula One being so exciting really difficult to see a future that was going to be as exciting, really. So I was starting to panic a little bit about what I was going to do. Ron was starting to panic because he didn't know what was going to happen to the Formula One team after that. Um, and then uh, with about 18 months to go, uh, Mansour Oje um, always wanted to do a road car, even at Williams when they were sponsoring Saudi, was, was sponsoring a tag, was sponsoring uh, Williams. He wanted to do a road car with them. So we started talking about it. 
um, famously at Lenate Airport. It was Crichton Brown, Ron Dennis, me, and Mansour. And it was like, well, you know, what are we going to do with this guy? And I've always wanted to do a road car. I couldn't see why, you know, you had to go to Italy to get a supercar, really. We've got fantastic technology in this country. The, the story of the McLaren F1 is, is, is amazing in, in terms of how far it went to redefining what a supercar was. Am I right in thinking you had two different weights of bolts and if one of the designers wanted to use the heavier one, they had to come and argue their case with you? Uh, no, that was washers. Washers, sorry, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> you have what you call, <coughs> what we call a toned and chamfered washer, which is about one and a half millimetres thick. And then you have a, a stamped washer, which is about a millimetre thick. And if somebody wanted to use a thicker one, they had to come and explain why. <laughs> or if they wanted to use a bolt bigger than 10 millimetres for anything, they had to come and show me the calculations and prove why they needed a bolt bigger than 10 millimetres. So, but, but you have to, if you're going to hit a weight target, you have to have that attention. Formula One's like that, you know. Formula One, there's no fat on a Formula One car. The, the McLaren F1 was always designed as a road car. What was your reaction when you discovered that punters inevitably wanted to race the thing? I was terribly worried because I hadn't even thought about the thing racing. In fact, I'd said to Mansour and Ron, you know, don't make me do a racing car because I want to do a nice GT car that, you know, you could drive to the south of France. And... Uh, so when people first approached us to go racing, my first, I was horrified, actually, because I thought it's not going to be very quick, because I've, I haven't thought about it being a racing car. But I, I should have thought that as a racing car designer, subconsciously, it had everything you needed to make a racing car quick, you know, light, torsional stiffness, low polar moment of inertia, uh, low center of gravity, pure wishbone geometry, front and rear, ground effect aerodynamics, you know, it had everything you needed, really. But it, what I honestly, what didn't cross my mind to make it a racing car. But it then won them all outright. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> am, I, am I right in thinking that in one of your notebooks from school, you sketched, this is 20 years before the McLaren F1, you sketched a three-seater sports car with a yes. central driving position That's the rear in the, in the driving ambition book. It, I think it was 69. One of my notebooks. I actually did that layout, yeah. What took you so long? <laughs> Formula One. Oh, yeah. Mm. So just, just going back briefly to, to Formula One, if I may, over the period you worked in it, I mean, you worked with Senna, with Prost, with PK, with Lauda, proven winners like John Watson, Carlos Reutemann. And how good was Carlos Pache? I mean, he's one of those guys who never uh, really fulfilled... Or you, I mean, he, he was taken, yeah, he was taken before... Mean, Moco, he, Moco. He, Bernie and I agreed from the second race, I think, that guy could be world champion. Apart from being a really nice guy, he had masses of natural ability. Um, my wife tells a good story because um, I got married about the same month I started at Brabham, June 1970. And she loves telling the story. And we didn't have much money. So we, but for our honeymoon, we'd booked a little place down at Bybury, Devon thing somewhere, for about three nights. And we shot off in our little Lotus of Land, which kept falling apart. So <laughs> and we shot off to Bybury. We were one night in Bybury, and I'd spotted uh, this young guy bef long before that, Carlos Pache, and he was racing at Thruxton in Formula 3 that weekend. So after one night in Bybury, I said to her, are you interested in Stonehenge? <laughs> 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 she must have told the story a thousand times. <laughs> and, and she said, why? And I said, well, it's on the way back, you know. And, and I'd like to see it. You know, you haven't seen it. I haven't seen it. But she said, but we've still got another couple of days here. I said, yeah, but, you know, I really need to get back to work. So let's drive back slowly tomorrow, and we're going to see Stonehenge. So we sh I bombed back to Stonehenge. In those days, you could go right up to the stones. Had a sandwich. Stonehenge went... There's a Formula 3 race on at Thruxton this afternoon. It's just down the road. Yeah. <laughs> I went and watched Carlos Pache. And that was the first time I went and spoke to him. But Bernie and I had our eye on him for a while, and he could have been world champion. Yeah. 
what what was it like working with Senna and Prost? Were they not noticeably a sort of a level above? Oh yeah, they were both very very good, and both gave very good engineering feedback. Um, I brought in a rule because when I started at McLaren, they both had their own race engineers under John Barnard. Uh, not Senna, but the drivers had their own race engineers, Prost. And uh, they used to go off after practice, they used to go off in a little huddle somewhere and talk through suspensions separately, tyres and things. And it was like, I arrived at McLaren, what's going on? You know, they, they're employees. We've got one hour's practice, you get two hours worth of information if you get the people together. I've always done that at Brabham. So I got them together and I said, from now on, this is the first race. From now on, you're both going to be in the same part of the truck and we're going to have a debrief together. And if I catch anybody doing separate chats, there's going to be some punishment. And sure enough, it was fantastic. You know, we, not only did they start getting on a little bit better, they were always jealous of one another, but they started getting on a bit better. But we got double the information. There was a little bit of double bluffing going on. Obviously, you know, I'm going out on the sea ties and we go, really? Sea <laughs> it's a bit triple bluffing even. Um, but, but largely we got more information. And then once I caught Alan Prost behind a truck um, with, like his en his yeah, <laughs> with his engineer talking about tires. And I think I took a set of qualifying tires away from him or something. Punishment. <laughs> Amazing. Now, do, do we are going to have a chance to, to uh, for you guys to ask questions. So do you know? Do have a think about them. Um, before we go there, tell us a bit about what you're doing at the moment because you've got a, a new supercar coming out. Yeah, we started a new company in the business. We've got um, Gordon Murray Designs now been going for nearly 14 years, and that's doing our ice cream manufacturing, and that's cobbling away very nicely. We're working with six or seven companies all around the world using ice cream manufacturing process. Um, but in 2017, in November, at our 50th anniversary event right, for celebrating 50 years in car design, um, we announced we would start Gordon Murray Automotive and just do limited run cars. I'm not, I'm, I don't want to be a big car company in business. So it's not where I'm going. Um, and the main reason was I honestly don't think anybody's done a McLaren F1 since the F1. I don't think anybody's done a car that focused on not just lightweight, but on the quality of the engineering and focused on the driver. And I added up all the supercars in the last 15 years and the average weight was 1,410 kilos. And the F1's 1,100, so nobody's really trying that hard, <laughs> I think. I, you know, really, there's some fantastic motor cars out there. I mean, I've driven all of them on the road and the track. McLaren 720S is probably the most competent motor car I've ever driven, sports car I've ever driven. You know, it does everything. But it doesn't quite involve you, you know, the same way the F1 did with the normally aspirated engine and the lightweight and the, the direction changing and stuff and the noise. Um, so I thought, well, if nobody else has done one, it's 50 years of car design, we should. So we're just doing one for fun, really. So we're just doing 100 cars again, and it's 980 kilos, brand new V12 with Cosworth, 12,000 revs. Small um, washers. Small washers. <laughs> <laughs> All over again, and I've got a great team of people this time. I mean, I only had seven people doing the F1. I've got about 20 people this time. And uh, I'm, I'm having more fun, and, oh, and it's a fan car. <laughs> is so it twin, twin fans? Or no, single, single fan, yeah. single fan, yeah, 400 mil fan. So we can generate downforce at much lower speeds, you know, B-road type speeds. Am I right in thinking that when the McLaren F1 design office, when you went in, there was a really badly designed, was it an air conditioning unit or, so, or something off a car that was really bulky? and No, no, I got that. So when the designers, when we moved in, I found what it was was a Jaguar part and it was a bracket for the compressor for the air conditioning on the engine which was cast iron and looked like it should have been on a tanker, a ship. And I put that on the entrance to the drawing, on top of a cabinet, on the entrance to the drawing office so every time anybody walked in or out of the design office they had to walk past it. It was like 
don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely fantastic. Um, right, I think we, we should really open it up to everyone as well, first hand here. We've actually, we've got a microphone um, somewhere. There we go, up at the back. Uh, so there's a question down here. Thanks, Laura. Hi. Um, just a question on the McLaren F1. Um, I think you said one of your regrets was when it won in 2005 at Le Mans. You didn't um, put it back on road tyres and drive the thing back. Yeah. I, sh yeah. I mean, that was... That, you know, I didn't think we were going to win. <laughs> Otherwise, we would have planned that, probably. Uh, but it was a car that you literally could drive to the circuit and race and drive home, and it still is. I mean, there's people... I know I've got a lot of friends that have got GTRs that actually use them on the road. Nick Mason, for example, drives his on the road. Um, that would have been a great bit of publicity. Yeah. Those, those publicity opportunities don't come along very often. The other one I nearly got to do was we had to do uh, a crash test with the F1 into a concrete block at 30 miles an hour on a sled. And uh, I talked to Myra, who did it at Myra, I talked to Myra about me sitting in the car instead of a crash test dummy. And I thought that would be great publicity. The designer is so confident. <laughs> uh, and we got six days away from the crash test, and I was going to do that, and then they couldn't get insurance. So that would have been another one that would have been nice. Can I just ask very quickly about the value of the McLaren F1? It's soared now to such mm. a high value. Are you worried that um, it's only in the reach now of um, investors rather than wealthy enthusiasts? Yeah, yeah. it's a, it's, it's a double-edged sword, isn't it? It's It's... You can't, how do you quantify a good motor car? It's all subjective. Some people like cars, some people don't. You know, it's very subjective. So the value increase, I suppose, is, is a measure, it's a metric uh, where you can quantify the success of motor car. That's the good bit. The bad bit is exactly what you say. People don't want to drive them anymore, you know. Um, and... That's another reason why I'm doing T50, because T50 has got everything the F1's got, but 30 years better. And it's a mere 2.36 million pounds. <laughs> Start so <selling> now. <laughs> relative, relative to an F1, it's, you know. Are you looking at the Le Mans rules? Yeah. I'm talking to the uh, ACO at the moment. So, we, <laughs> so uh, we may well see a fan car racing. I, they probably wouldn't let me use the fan because Article 3.7 has been changed. <laughs> right. Um, let's, let's have some more questions. Sorry, hand over, over there. Thank you. Did Jim Hall copy your fan system on the chaparral? No, he was, uh, the chaparral was way before us, I think. Yeah. But that was a completely different, we, we were nothing like the Chaparral because that was an unlimited formula. So uh, he had three engines, you know. If you tried to run three engines in Formula One, you wouldn't get through scrutineering. <laughs> so we had to come up with something slightly more sophisticated. They literally just put two snowmobile engines on the back of the car <laughs> and that was it, you know. We had to come up, we had a drive off, the, a quill shaft driving off the back of the output shaft on the gearbox and four separate clutches and a completely new gear set driving the fan. It was a very complex system. Really? Yeah, um, the Chaparral was impressive when it's... <laughs> yeah. Well, this thing, yeah, the, the, the F1, um, the mechanics, I, I had a, a lid in the top of the body that I asked the mechanics when they were revving the car up in the pits to unscrew the lid so we had a leak. Um, because, and once they forgot, in Sweden, and they were revving the car up, and the thing was bouncing up and down, <laughs> on the right. which really upset the other teams. <laughs> <laughs> right, we've got another question. There we go. Yeah. In your uh, column in Classic and Sports Car, you said that you'd had an opportunity from Mercedes to have any car you wanted as a road car, and you chose a smart roadster for 14 years. Yeah. I, I bought one on the strength of that, which I think... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Along with, uh, no, it's fantastic. Along with a fi uh, Fiat 507, the same as you've got. I quite admire your eclectic car collection. Well, there, uh, there you go. What are your favourite road cars in sort of real terms, rather than, say, an F1? Ah... Uh. Well, that story was really funny because I had a contract that said I could, as technical director, 
I could have two Mercedes-Benz cars up to the value of £150,000 total um, and change them every year. My wife chose an A-Class, which, and she still drives an A-Class, and I, tro- I chose a Smart, and it was, I had a 16 years of Roadster. And uh, Ron Dennis, I was talking to Ron one day in his office, and he said, why do you, uh, he said, why do you drive a Smart and, st- <laughs> and still drives an A-Class, and why do you keep them that long? He said, you could have an SL 500 or whatever it was, new every year, and she could have an E-Class estate. And I said, I don't want one, and she doesn't want one of those, you know. And we just, we just never did. These days, I've finally got rid of the, 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 um, the, the little smart roadster. It's been driven really hard for 16 years, and it started dismantling itself. Um, there, there seems to be a theme here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I do drive cars quite hard. And I switched last year to a Renault, uh, sorry, not a Renault, Alpine A110, which is my current road car, which I have to say is a great little motor car. It's a bit big physically. If it was six inches narrow, it would be fantastic. Um, but it's, it's light. It's got very good torsional rigidity, fantastic compromise between ride and handling. The compliance is the best car, up until then, the Lotus Evora was the best car I've driven for compliance. Uh, this, this is better. Um, so that's my everyday road car. But actually, in summer, you never see me in anything. I'm, I drive classics all the time. Last week, I, I uh, with the sun, you know, I was, uh, what did I have? Porsche 550 Spider, Series 2 Lotus 7, 58 Lotus 11, all the open cars. Um, last week. Um, so I'm in, I'm in classic cars or on a motorcycle in this sort of weather. Am I allowed to mention that a couple of years ago you were having a Mark I Escort built, weren't you? It's still being built. It's on the <laughs> dyno. It's on the dyno tomorrow, actually. Should, I should get it October. Okay. D- is it possible for you to, to drive these cars and not want to improve them and change things and I mean classic they- cars no you don't you don't really I mean if they were they are what they are you know I mean the Lotus the, the Lotus 11 is 58 it's a racing car it's on open pipes you know, my wife says she can hear me two miles away <laughs> put, put, puts the dinner on you know? <laughs> um, and it's a real bone shaker but it's fun you know it's on skinny little t- wire wheel tight ty- no, narrow, narrow tires drifts and everywhere it's lovely Excellent. Right, we got uh, anyone. Here we go. Question, question here. Uh, in this month's Road Rat magazine, um, you you uh, talk about uh, meeting George Harrison mm-hmm. and um, running his car for him. Is the Harrison ho- household still got the F1, and do you still use it? It has at the moment. Yeah, live. I've still stayed very friendly with. Uh, Danny, I was like a second dad to Danny, and, and we live Harrison, we see a lot. Um, and whenever I go round there, and she wants me to give the car a run, um, and, and uh, there's, there's a great bit of dual carriageway just north of Henley, which, and you can, it's, it's very short, but you can just get the snow. Is this being recorded? Yes. We can bleep it's it It's a really nice bit of dual carriageway. <laughs> Did you get Barbara back out of it in the end? That was what I was going to, the story I was going to tell. Um, the F1 may, may not have been on this particular time, but you can get up to 150 and back down again really quickly. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I was giving Ringo's wife a, a drive in it, and uh, we got back to Fryer Park, and she, she actually couldn't, couldn't get out of the car. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. <laughs> right, <laughs> have we got... Yep, another question there. Um, what's your view uh, looking forward in terms of motive power? Is electric the answer, or what, what do you think? Actually, the, the, the final answer, if, if we can make hydrogen efficiently, would be a fuel cell. Um, but at the moment, we, t- we use more oil to make a litre of this equivalent energy of hydrogen than you do petrol. 
So the process, it, it needs, we need to invent some other way of making you know, hydrogen that's cost effective and clean. Um, that's the answer long term. Electric cars is probably a short term uh, solution, but you have to look at the full life cycle and where you're generating the electricity. I mean, in some countries that are still relying heavily on coal, for example, and if you do the full life cycle analysis, electric's not that good. You know? And I think in any case, internal combustion is going to be around with us for quite some time to come. But you, so you're on the, you were saying before, you're on the automotive council, council for mm. the government. It, it's, should they not, should we not be building electric cars then, if the life cycle is not very good? This country's not bad. We have a certain percentage of renewable here. Um, I don't know what it is currently. 30%, maybe 40%, don't know. Yeah, I'm like nodding that. as if. Something like that. <laughs> <Yeah>. um, <laughs> but you really have to look at the full life cycle, you know, making the battery, making the car. The car's heavier, obviously, so things like tyres and stuff wear out quicker. Um, it's, it's an urban, I would say electric cars at the moment are a good urban uh, answer, but you're moving the pollution out to where you're generating the, the electricity. The other, the other reason why they aren't that good at the moment is the current battery technology, the energy density is so bad, we're carrying around half a tonne of batteries you know, to do 200 miles. Um, petrol's, the, the problem we've all got is petrol is too efficient. If you think of it, a litre of fuel, the energy you get in a litre of fuel, and of course you only need a fifteenth of the fuel with you that you carry around. The other 15 parts are in the air. Whereas battery car, you've got to carry everything with you. What we really need to make uh, electric cars viable, we need the next generation of batteries, which is, you know, there's a lot of people working on it. We need much more energy density per cell, and it's coming. We need more renewable energy to make the electricity in the first place. And then we need to look seriously about limiting the size of electric cars. It's pointless making a two-ton electric car because you're using more brakes, more tires, more energy to make the thing in the first place. But it's, it's a sort of a stopgap, I think. Right, so have we got uh, any more questions? Uh, yes, well, there we go. Your other passion is obviously music. So other than Dylan, which you mentioned a few times, what, what's your favourite? I, I know you're a collection of T-shirts and, and you keep them all somewhere. In your, so who, what's your passion in music-wise? I'm, pr I'm pretty broad, actually. Um, I'm, not, I'm not that much into sort of modern stuff like rap and industrial and all that stuff. But, but other than that, I've got, I've got a collection that goes back to the 20s. I've got about 7,000 records. Uh, a lot of vinyl, and and goes back to yeah early folk. Um, uh, a lot of. Uh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, that's where I sort of started with the Dylan, Woody Guthrie, Lead Belly. You know, that's where I mean, Woody Guthrie came from Lead Belly, and Dylan came from Woody Guthrie. Um, but nowadays, I mean, I sort of started in well, I was ten getting serious about music. I remember saving up for months for Guy Mitchell singing the blues, which is pretty wishy-washy as rock and roll goes. <laughs> and then a month later, I heard Little Richard, and that was the end of that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Have we got any yeah, questions down the, down the front? Ever. I think as a driver's car, the, the best sports car I think I've ever driven is still the Elan. Um, just from the point of view of steering feel and balance, I would say, still. I mean, it's just a magic little formula. Although recently I bought a Europa Twin Cam, and I've never driven one before, and that's pretty close, actually. You know, it, it feels exactly what it should feel like. It feels like a rear engine load of Elan. You know, it's, steering feel is really good. Uh, the direction change is actually slightly better. The transient handling is slightly better. And the secondary ride is better than the Elan. But overall, I would still say the Elan has it on balance. Once you're drifting, 
you know, once you've got all four wheels loose. Yeah. How quick is the Europa on the Henley Bypass? <laughs> 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 Excellent. Right, have we got any more questions? <laughs> there we go. Oh, we've got one here and then we'll come up to you in a second. Thank you. Um, it just, I, w I wondered if you share um, the enthusiast point of view at the minute where we're in this trend of supercars getting ever more quicker more BHP, do you, do you think that someone like Ferrari or Porsche would be brave enough to bring out a car that's not as quick as its predecessor, but is more focusing on that analog driving, something that we, a lot of people really miss these days with the modern, modern supercars? That's a really good question, and that's why I'm doing T50. You know, I, I suffered terribly from people pushing 240 miles an hour in my face. You know, the F1 was the fastest car in the world, still the fastest, normally aspirated car. I promise I never had a performance target when I did the F1. I just wanted to try and do the best sports car I could and the best driver's car. It just happened to go quick because it was light and small. And I, it's exactly the same with 50. I can't speak for other manufacturers because they all seem to be wrapped up in this top speed, lap time, 0 to 60. It's all completely irrelevant if the thing isn't enjoyable to drive, you know. And we're finding a lot of the, of the people that have bought T50 um, are, are people that are more and more taking out their 911 RS rather than their LaFerrari or the P1 McLaren or something because it, it's much more involving. So whether there'll be a turnaround or not, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm acting completely independently, and I just want to do another driver's car. I don't care what the 0 to 60 is. It's going to be quick. I mean, it's got, it's got a better power-weight ratio than a LaFerrari, a better power-to-weight ratio than a P1 GTR, so it's going to be fast. But I don't care how fast. It, as long as it in, it's involving and the, the controls are all analog and everything feels good when you drive it, and the experience is good, and the noise. I mean, I can't wait to hear 12,100 revs. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you think maybe that uh, McLaren may be looking at what you're doing, and when you bring out the car, they also might be inspired to do a modern successor, their own version of the, the F1, let's say? I hope so, actually. I hope, I hope people, because where is it going to end? You know, <laughs> it's, it's car design, there's a virtuous circle with lightweight, and that is if, if you have a lightweight target, you don't need the power and the torque, and therefore the drive shafts are smaller, the brakes are smaller, the hub carriers are smaller, the bearings are less stiff, the wheels and tyres are smaller, and it's a virtuous circle. Once you start chasing horsepower or top speed, it's the other way. You know, before you know where you are, you've got a two-ton car because you needed 1,500 horsepower and everything's bigger and heavier and more complex. And you've lost the transient handling and the involvement that you get for, from feedback. Cars are all about feedback. We still drive with, literally with the seat of our pants, you know, that's, and, and, and your head. That's what's, that's what's giving you the feedback that brings in the enjoyment. Thank you. So we've got one more, sorry, we have two. Was there, did you want to ask a question? There's one up there, so we'll do two more questions. And Sorry, it's just uh, down in the second row here. I, I was just interested to know, in that very tight-knit Brabham team of the late 70s, early 80s, the contribution of someone like a Nelson Piquet w w w was, uh, in terms of testing, in terms of a colourful character, w what were your impressions of, of him and memories of him? Well, in that, in that period, driver feedback was everything. I mean, we didn't have, we didn't get telemetry until the 80s uh, of any sort. So it was just the engineer's relationship with the driver and the driver's ability to tell the engineer what the car was doing and describe that accurately. And Nelson was a really good case because he, he came up from Formula 3. The first time I saw Nelson was at Brands Hatch, Herbie Blash and I again we're keeping an eye on him and watching him and he was changing ratios in his Formula 3 car himself 
So, I mean, he's a very practical guy. And he was so keen to learn. He bought, he rent, I beg your pardon, he, he rented a flat near Bradman, Chessington, when he moved to Chessington. And he had a bicycle and he used to come and sit, which drive me mad actually, he used to come and sit on the side of the drawing board all day. And when we went down to the wind tunnel in Southampton, he used to come down to the wind tunnel and he was forever asking questions and wanting to learn about why this did that and why. It, and that was the basis for him being a very good uh, driver from a feedback point of view. I think it also, sorry, the other thing is it also helps if you've driven yourself, because I used to race in the 60s, and if you've driven yourself, you, you know what the driver's trying to tell you, you know. Yes, there was one more question up at the top, was it? Yeah. Not about cars, your other passion is music. You say you've got a lot of vinyl. What do you play it on? I've got a system deck, um, one of those, one of those sort of homemade things that, you know, the guys churn them out in their back garden, make five a year or something, uh, with rubber bands. You know, to change the speed, you've got to take the rubber band off the pulley, and yeah. one of those jobs. <laughs> I can't remember what the cartridge is. I think it's Japanese. It's a long time ago now, um, the cartridge. And the front end is, um, I've got Kef, uh, reference speakers, right. which I've had for yonks. Yeah. Um, and I haven't heard anything better. And I'm, I'm being half deaf since Formula One anyway, so it doesn't really matter. <laughs> and the front end is um, the preamp and power amp. I actually tag, tag electronics. Oh. Do, you do you remember tag yeah, yeah. hi-fi? Yeah. A guy called Dr. Uda Zucker. Yeah. Very clever guy. Uh, I've still got those, actually. Wow. And a Nakamichi tape deck. Oh, I've got a Nakamichi tape. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I still master to tape, funnily enough, if I'm doing compilation. Wow. Thank you. Excellent. Well, it's, uh, just before I forget, the, the winner of the silent auction is Claire Collingwood. So if you'd like to see the reception desk on the way out, um, congratulations. Uh, Gordon, it has been absolutely fascinating. You talk so much sense on so many subjects, I sort of slightly wish you were running the, running the country, but um, <laughs> <coughs> uh, maybe one day. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Princess Yachts, the UK's leading luxury yacht manufacturer, proud sponsors of motorsports Formula One coverage.